Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is pneumatic schematics. Our objective is to examine the schematic symbols used to represent common pneumatic devices. If you've been following this playlist in its intended sequence, you should already be familiar with most of the pneumatic devices we're about to discuss. Additionally, you should have had a comforting level of familiarity between pneumatic and hydraulic schematics, as these two fluid power technologies often use identical symbols and any minor modifications are easily explicable. This lecture therefore serves as not necessarily an introduction to pneumatic schematics, but rather a review. If at any time you feel this lecture is over your head, by all means revisit and review the previous lectures. This being said, it's not all review and does introduce some new devices unique to pneumatic systems on an introductory level. Later lectures will examine these new devices in greater detail. Pneumatic schematics, quite like electrical and hydraulic schematics, make the task of representing the connection of those devices constituting a larger system easier, more efficient, and understandable. Consider three different methods of illustrating a single directional control valve. The pictorial representation, while accurate, isn't easy to draw nor comprehend. The cutaway diagram, while detailed, it's confusing. The schematic symbol, in contrast, makes it possible to simply and efficiently represent circuit functions even when employing devices from different manufacturers. Before we dive into this collection of schematics, let it be known that you may encounter subtle and not so subtle variations of illustrating the same components in the field. Don't for a moment think on the final judge on standards, nor should you award that title to anyone else, even if they loudly proclaim otherwise. Long story short, it is the wild, wild west out there, and absolutely anything and everything goes. All I'm trying to do is share some of the experience I've gathered and do not have a horse in the standards race. Let's first establish some general guidelines about conductors, connections, and shapes common in pneumatic schematics. Pneumatic conductors, including pipes, tubes, hoses, and passages inside valve bodies, fall into two categories, primary and pilot. Primary conductors, i.e. the working lines that transmit high pressure, high flow rate pneumatic power, are schematically represented as solid lines. In contrast, pilot lines, i.e. the sensory lines and passages that transmit low pressure, low flow rate air-based control signals, are represented schematically as dashed lines. You often see pilot lines internal to another device's schematic symbol indicating which port is being monitored by the pilot passage. For example, the dashed pilot line on a pressure regulator monitors pressure on its output. Additionally, you might see pilot lines actuating air piloted directional control valves. Connected fluid conductors are indicated with a dot at the intersection, whereas unconnected fluid conductors do not have a dot at an intersection. I find this method a little confusing, so one might go to the trouble of indicating unconnected conductors to simply cross on a schematic diagram using an overpass symbol. You will appreciate the clarity this modifier provides as circuits increase in complexity. Let's now discuss some common thematic elements found in pneumatic schematics. First, rotational devices like compressors, electric motor prime movers, and pneumatic motors are schematically represented using a round circle. Valves and valve positions, as we learned in the Pneumatic Directional Control Valves lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, are ordinarily represented schematically as boxes. Fluid conditioning devices like filters, lubricators, aftercoolers, and dryers, and all the rest are schematically represented as diamonds. There are exceptions to this diamond rule, notably magnetic and optical proximity switches or sensors or other solid state devices like pressure sensors. These sensory and input devices are also sometimes illustrated using diamond. Lastly, a slanting arrow indicates some feature is adjustable. Now that we've got some general guidelines about conductors, connections, and general shapes, let's start our tour of pneumatic schematics with a review of air preparation elements we discuss in the Air Preparation and Pneumatic Systems Lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. Prime movers are devices that convert one form of input into rotational mechanical power. In the case of a motor prime mover, a motor converts electrical power into rotational mechanical power. An electric motor is schematically represented as a circle with an M inside it. Prime movers, like motors, are used to turn the shaft of a compressor. Compressors are mechanical power to fluid power converters. A compressor is represented schematically as a circle with an empty arrowhead pointing away from the compressor body in the direction of provided flow. The shaft linking the motor and compressor is schematically represented as a bar or a dashed line. Ordinarily, motors and compressors are linked via coupling, where the coupling compensates for misalignment and allows the technician to take the pair apart for maintenance and repair purposes. You recall pneumatic systems do not necessitate a return reservoir, as is common in hydraulic systems, largely because we are quite literally immersed in the power transfer medium of choice central to pneumatic systems, air. For this reason, air is often exhausted back into the environment via an exhaust port symbolized as an outward pointing empty arrowhead. To minimize the sound of escaping air, pneumatic systems often make use of silencers or mufflers 
symbolizes a maze-like zigzag passage, which may or may not be included in the schematic. Despite having no need for a return reservoir, pneumatic systems often don't empty a compressor's output straight into a pneumatic system, but rather a receiver or a tank intermediary, a sealed metal housing schematically represented as an oval. A pressure switch on the receiver senses pressure inside the receiver. Using a simple form of on-off compressor control, the motor can be started or stopped at the request of the pressure switch. More advanced systems might make use of a pressure transducer, which is an analog device which measures pressure. Lastly, a regulator selectively opens and closes the passage from the receiver to the pneumatic circuit. If a regulator is venting or relieving, it includes an exhaust port back to atmosphere and sometimes may use a bidirectional arrow. Numerous accessory components are often found in close proximity to receivers, including, but not limited to, measurement devices like pressure gauges and flow meters, box-shaped accessory valves like safety pressure relief valves, dump or drain valves, and shutoff valves, and finally, diamond-shaped air conditioning devices like filter separators, lubricators, aftercoolers, and dryers. Pressure gauges are schematically represented as a dial and an arrow with a single measurement passage. Pressure gauges measure units of PSI, bar, or kilopascals. We'll also examine vacuum gauges, which measure pressure below atmospheric conditions in later lectures. Flow meters, in contrast, are schematically represented as kind of a baseball-looking circle. Flow meters are mounted in the path through which they intend to measure flow and necessitate air travel through them. Flow meters measure airflow in units of standard cubic feet per minute or standard liters per minute. Flow meters are ordinarily unidirectional. If so, a schematic may indicate the proper flow direction with the arrow pointing in to out. Also, certain flow meters necessitate they be mounted in orientation-dependent fashion and won't work if installed upside down, sideways, or at an angle. Safety pressure relief valves are normally closed valves that sense pressure on their input. If, however, pressure inside the receiver rises above the set value of the safety pressure relief valve, the safety pressure relief valve opens and vents the excess pressure to the receiver to the atmosphere. Note the exhaust port back to atmosphere. Dump or drain valves are used to evacuate the receiver as part of a lockout and tagout procedure or regular maintenance activities. They might be schematically represented as a simple pair of opposing triangles or as two by two valves with a detented actuator, meaning that when you open it, it stays open and when you close it, it stays closed. A filter separator is schematically represented as a diamond with a dashed line and a triangle on the bottom drain port. The fine mesh of the filter physically excludes airborne contaminants and the separator flings heavier contaminants and moisture to the bottom of the bowl. A manual drain on the bottom of the filter separator bowl allows any accumulated moisture and debris to be removed during periodic maintenance. If a filter separator has an automatic drain, it will include another triangle in the schematic symbol. Lubricators are schematically represented as a diamond with a line hanging off the top. Since air is not inherently self-lubricating like oil in hydraulic systems, lubricators periodically apportion a small squirt or fine mist of oil to the compressed air entering a pneumatic circuit. The introduction of oil into the airstream ensures the dynamic seals between moving actuators and valves remain functional. Systems lacking lubricators may necessitate technicians performing regular maintenance to periodically manually lubricate individual components to ensure their reliable operation. Since filter separators, relieving regulators, pressure gauges, and lubricators are often found in close proximity to one another, certain manufacturers may consolidate all these components into a single simplified schematic symbol that looks like this, where you can see elements of each component. One might hear a filter, regulator, lubricator referred to using the abbreviation FRL. Aftercoolers are heat exchangers schematically represented as diamonds, with arrows pointing away from the air to be cooled, passing through the center. If an aftercooler makes use of a liquid or an air heat transfer fluid, or HTF, the HTF is routed counter to airflow. This counterflow arrangement ensures that continual temperature gradient occurs the length of the aftercooler tube and shell heat exchanger. Dryers are schematically represented as diamonds with two parallel lines. Since the act of compression changes the temperature and moisture carrying capacity of compressed air, you might find accessory components like aftercoolers and dryers should the larger system warrant their inclusion. Lastly, you might see a push to fit quick disconnect fitting illustrated at the output of the compressor circuit. When a matching fitting is inserted in the quick disconnect, it pushes the poppet off the seat and allows flow from the pneumatic source to the circuit. Since compressor circuits can get a little busy, one might find the entire compressor circuit including the motor prime mover, compressor, receiver, regulator, and all the junk hanging off of it, simplified as a single empty arrowhead pointing into the system. Using a simplified symbol like this really cuts down on the busy work. Now that we've taken a look at the components associated with pneumatic sources, let's take a look at the business end of a pneumatic system, notably the actuators that do the heavy work of lifting, lowering, pushing, pulling, or turning a load. There's a couple general types of actuators. 
linearly acting pneumatic cylinders, and rotational acting pneumatic motors. Additionally, there's a couple special purpose bonus round actuators you may encounter. Pneumatic cylinders convert pneumatic power to linear mechanical power. There are a dizzying array of special purpose cylinders, but most fall into two general classes, single acting and double acting. Single acting pneumatic cylinders have only one port and only actively perform one movement. Ordinarily, single acting pneumatic cylinders rely on a spring or the weight of a lifted object to passively perform the opposite movement. Our first cylinder is a spring retracted pneumatically extended single acting cylinder. With no pressure in the cap end, the spring in the rod passively retracts the cylinder. Extension necessitates pressurized flow enter the cap end. In contrast, the second single acting pneumatic cylinder is spring extended pneumatically retracted. With no pressure in the rod end, the spring in the cap passively extends the cylinder. Retraction necessitates pressurized flow into the rod end. These type of spring extended pneumatically retracted single acting cylinders are commonly used in fail safe braking applications where the act of removing the brake necessitates air pressure or in the loss of air pressure, the spring applies the brake. Viewers will note that these are two totally opposite components, despite them both being single acting cylinders. The deactivated state of a spring retracted pneumatically extended cylinder is retracted, whereas the deactivated state of a spring extended pneumatically retracted cylinder is extended. When subject to pressurized flow, these cylinders change states. A spring retracted pneumatically extended cylinder extends, whereas a spring extended pneumatically retracted cylinder retracts. As I caution you in the pneumatic directional control valve lecture, Sometimes the life and well-being of technicians and operators depends upon the proper interpretation of schematic symbols. Be sure you know what the deactivated and activated states of an actuator or valve imply to a larger pneumatic system. Viewers will additionally note that single acting pneumatic cylinders sometimes incorporate a vent port on the spring end to keep the space from being obstructed. This vent port may or may not be indicated in the schematic symbol. Double acting pneumatic cylinders in contrast have both a rod end port and cap end port. Whereas single acting cylinders only actively performed one movement and passively performed the opposite via a weight or a spring, double acting cylinders actively work on both extension and retraction. The act of extending a double acting pneumatic cylinder routes pressurized flow to the cap end and exhausts the rod end. In contrast, the act of retracting a double acting pneumatic cylinder routes pressurized flow to the rod end and exhausts the cap end. Since air is compressible and occupies different volumes at different pressure and temperature conditions, Speed control in pneumatics can be an elusive and ever-moving target. As a consequence, pneumatic cylinders can sometimes rapidly pop into place and wear out quickly if they're not protected from sudden and frequent decelerations. For this reason, some pneumatic cylinders incorporate cushions at the limits of extension and retraction. Schematically, these cushions might be illustrated as a small box on the piston. If the cushion is adjustable, it'll have a slanting arrow. You will note cylinders, regardless of the type, do not lift or lower loads, but rather only extend or retract. Instead, the mounting method for a particular cylinder is the determining factor whether a load is lifted or lowered. For example, this configuration lifts on extension and lowers on retraction, whereas this configuration lifts on retraction and lowers on extension. Additionally, do not assume linearly extending and retracting pneumatic cylinders yield only linear results. Pneumatic cylinders can tip or tilt a load or drive a load in an arc using pivoting trunnions and clevis mounts. Speaking of rotation, another common actuator you may encounter in pneumatic systems are pneumatic motors, which are essentially the opposite of compressors, and the schematic symbol tells us this quite succinctly. A compressor converts rotational mechanical power to fluid power. In contrast, a pneumatic motor converts pneumatic power to rotational mechanical power. Note the arrows of a pneumatic motor poured inwards, indicating the pneumatic motor consumed pneumatic power, whereas the compressor provides it. Bidirectional pneumatic motors have two inward pointing arrows, whereas unidirectional pneumatic motors have a single inward pointing arrow.